Hello friends, welcome to Mac Truck Bookstop. This is Mike here, and we're talking about Fernando Pessoa's The Book of Disquiet from the country of Portugal here on this fine wintry April day. And um, yeah, this book took me close to a month to read. Um, it was kind of one I was able to finish just in chunks here and there. Um, just, uh, you know, a little bit before bed or 10 here, 10 there. Um, there's, if you want to talk chapters, there are 481 chapters of the Book of Disquiet, um, or part of the, the Factless Autobiography, which is really the main, the main part that I'm talking about. I didn't, I didn't read all of the, um, appendixes and, um, the there's another attachment called the disquiet anthology at the end i didn't read that very carefully i just kind of browsed through it i felt like finishing a factless autobiography was a complete experience in itself and it's basically about um an assistant bookkeeper you're in the mind of an assistant bookkeeper or like a i guess which is what they call an accountant back in the day essentially or some type of low-level accountant um <clears throat> And this assistant bookkeeper um, is a uh, kind of an alter ego of Fernando Pessoa. Fernando Pessoa wrote under a number of different, um, I guess they call them hieronyms, uh, like alter egos where uh, some of them were poets. Uh, this one is, I guess, his most, um, Bernan was it Bernardo Soares is the name of the narrator of the book but it was so hard to distinguish what what part of it was Fernando Pessoa and what part of it was Bernardo Soares. Now this was of course originally written in Portuguese uh, for the most part but um, Fernando Pessoa was fluent in English, French, and Portuguese. He spent some of his childhood in South Africa um, and his writings were in all three languages. So there's, there really is, I guess, no definitive um, translation of this book, from what I understand. Um, but probably the closest you could get to the original language would be, or the original writing would be Portuguese. This is, um, of course, I read it in English because I, um, I'm not quite, quite fluent in Portuguese. Like I can, Spanish is fine, but um, and I can read, I can read quite a bit of Portuguese, but not enough to, um, feel confident in, in reading a novel yet. Um, but I hope to get there someday. I'd love to read some Brazilian and Portuguese literature in, in the original language. So, um, anyway, this might be a bit of a longer episode because I'm just taking my time with this one. Um, there is a lot to think about. There are, there are essentially infinite uh, ways you can approach talking about this book. Um, there's so much philosophy in it, so much ideas about, uh, uh impressions and, um, uh, different ways of thinking about things. And it's, you know, what's the, the best way I can describe it is you're inside, uh, just an incredibly, uh, uh, introverted, self-analyzing type of person you're inside their head and they have a normal job this Fernando Soares you know he's he's that normal guy at work you know working a normal job looks like any other person um, nothing too uh, flashy about him or uh, that stands out about him and yet inside his mind there is just this whole imaginative world that you cannot even comprehend and he's kind of like a secret genius, and um, but you're inside the mind of the secret genius as they are kind of putting on a front uh, to the to the rest of the world, um, and it's not even really a front. It's just what uh, how how would how would they how would their dreaming as Fernando Pessoa writes. And it's never quite clear to me whether dreaming, although it's mentioned in almost every chapter, it seems, or every other chapter, 
um, it's never quite clear to me if dreaming is referring to the act of dreaming while you're asleep or dream like daydreaming or both. Um, the writing is always quite uh, unclear on that, which I like. Uh, dreaming is is left as vague as possible, but that is what that is what Fernando Pessoa did in his life uh, and what he espoused and what he uh, um, recommends to all to live this way as dreamers inside their head. And um, in many ways, the, the personal connection that I could feel with the Book of Disquiet um, was... Now, Fernando Pessoa... It's funny, I haven't, I haven't even given a context of the time period that this was written in. Um, this was, this is Lisbon in the 1920s and 30s. Um, but this chest of writings that all, all of the, all of what's in here was found in like a big chest, um, in, and wasn't published until the 1980s. It, it, it had to be put together. Fernando Pessoa didn't even really put it together, but he did leave some instructions of how to compile it. So there's, there's a few different, um, compilations, I believe and translations of the Book of Disquiet that compile it a little bit differently is possible. This whole book is really kind of shrouded in mystery as to what it's actually supposed to be, and it's kind of a, it could be a creative process, actually, to read it. Um, I could imagine trying to read this in an alternate order um, of chapters, and uh, that, that could be, that could be interesting, or even mixing the stuff at the end, a disquiet anthology, um, into the writing and reading it alongside it, because it, it wasn't 100% clear if um, that was supposed to be a part or published with, uh, though it seemed Fernando Pessoa had in his head that it it probably should be published apart. So that's, that's the approach that this one took it. So, um, so yeah, Lisbon... Portugal in the 1920s and 30s, but, uh, and while there are descriptions of Lisbon, you know, you get the, the, the climate and the, um, the city, it's all, it's all inter, interconnected and intermingled with, with this wildly imaginative and, um, deep mind, um, that you are inside, um, and, I, I was um I was just about to talk about the personal connection I had to the book. Yeah, so for Fernando Pessoa, it's like think of the friend that you've had in your life. That's the most introverted person you can imagine. Maybe you are that person. I don't know. Um, I'm like I'm introverted, but I'm not. Um, I'm certainly not the most introverted person that I know. Um, I had a, a friend some time back who who really said a lot of things that are echoed in this book, and and sometimes I kind of felt like I was reading a bit of this old friend that unfortunately I've lost contact with, and and he's kind of um, a, from what I can tell with other people he's become a bit of a recluse, and that's fine. Uh, that's kind of what he what he wants. Um, you know, has has lost contact with a lot of old friends and things, but. Um, not to get personal, but I, I do want to, I'm trying to connect why, why this book was a personal connection to me. So many, in many ways, as I was, as I was going through the book, you know, I marked it up. I wrote in pencil, um, in almost, uh, every other page and, and was having a conversation with this book and, and with Fernando Pessoa and, um, in some ways felt like I was having a conversation with that friend um, one of the major themes is why travel? Be where you are. Travel in your mind, you know, in your imagination, um, which is, I think, where it kind of diverged. Like this, uh, like Fernando Pessoa was a wildly imaginative mind um, and um, had had his feet firmly on the ground, but just was somewhere else in his head, or at least the character he wrote. Again, it's hard to tell if it's Fernando Pessoa or... Um, Bernard uh, so Soares, you know, that, that, that is actually talking at any given time. It's hard to know what, what the author um, put in of himself because he was, you know, there, there's not a whole lot known about um, 
uh, Fernando Pessoa's life. Um, but there are a lot of there are a lot of these just little parts of this book that that um, that just you read them and it's like, wow. You know, it's the, the whole book is like that friend, that introverted friend of yours that like half the time you want to strangle them. And then the other half the time they say something that makes that just makes you blow your blow your mind. You're just like, oh, my God, that's amazing. And um, and uh, the 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 reason that I didn't get along with Fernando sometimes is he's incredible. Like the the book can be incredibly dismissive towards other people um there are a few times when it acknowledges that every everybody might have their own um personal internal world in the same way that um the narrator does but on some level it's um i i almost feel like there is a sort of like superiority complex and it kind of irks me that he justifies it sometimes because he really comes up with some some brilliant ideas in the book and some brilliant metaphors about the the human condition, especially the human condition of um, uh, being an introverted or reclusive person or a private person. Um, but it's also interesting to think about the context of this, you know, Fernando Pessoa and, and likewise his uh, hieronym, uh, uh, Bernardo, Bernardo, I keep saying Bernardo, Bernard, Bernardo Suarez are, um, you know, privileged people in this part of uh, the world of Portugal, and I, I don't know if you want to say privileged, I, that's a loaded word, but you could say maybe just, uh, they have a relatively carefree life um, in in material survival, in terms of material survival, in terms of what is demanded of them on a daily basis, you know, the, the Bernardo, Bernardo Soares has an office job, uh, and it's definitely not a tasking or demanding life that he leads. He has all this sort of time for dreaming and, and being depressed. And I think there's even passages that kind of touch on that. I'm specifically not, um, I would love to read you some passages, but it's like, what do I even choose? Like there is just so much in here. I don't, and, and there were a few that I circled like, Ooh, this is one of my favorites. Um, but uh but there were a lot of those there were a lot of those um it's uh in any in any single one that i read i don't feel is like going to give you any idea of the whole there were some parts where i wrote some nights i just want you to shut up fernando talking to the author and then other times um why are you so intolerable tonight i i literally had a conversation with the um, narrator in this book or asking myself, do I agree with this? And then I would, right after that, I'd underline something I really related to. I'm nauseated and outraged by the sincere souls of all sincerities and the mystics of all mysticism, or rather by the sincerities of all sincere souls and the mysticisms of all the mystics. I don't know why I underlined that. I guess it seemed relevant to me at the time, but like um, Fernando Pessoa and his narrator uh, certainly show a lot of disdain toward like altruism and any kind of idealism. Um, they, he just doesn't care for any sort of effort to make humanity as a whole better. And there's an interesting part where he mentions like you can love your neighbor. The, the Bible says to love your neighbor, but says nothing about uh, making mankind better <laughs> as a whole. Or something to that effect. Now, of course, he's not a particularly religious person. That was just, I think, an artistic um, use of of that. Um, it's certainly not, I don't want to give the impression that it's like there's a lot of religious sentiment in this book. It could be. It could be if you if you want to read it that way. Um, but then there's also this this word that he uses. Now, some of this stuff, some of the stuff in this book could come off as like really pessimistic. And there's even uh, a part where where he addresses this and says, like, you might think I'm uh, I'm pessimistic, but I'm not really me pessimistic. I'm sad. And he's um, he he talks that it's not that I'm pessimistic. What what I suffer from is tedium. 
And there's the way he describes tedium. Now, tedium to me sounds like being bored, but he he definitely sets it aside and, and spends a whole chapter describing tedium. I'll read this. Tedium. Perhaps deep down, it is the soul's dissatisfaction because we didn't give it a belief. The disappointment of the sad child, who we are on the inside because we didn't buy it the divine toy. Perhaps it is the insecurity of one who needs a guiding hand and who doesn't feel on the black path of profound sensation anything more than the soundless night of not being able to think, the empty road of not being able to feel. Tedium. Those who have gods don't have tedium. Tedium is the lack of a mythology. For people without beliefs, even doubt is impossible. Even their skepticism will lack the strength to question. Yes, tedium is the loss of the soul's capacity for self-delusion. It is the mind's lack of the non-existent ladder by which it might firmly ascend to the truth. And I wrote after that, was Pedro Paramo a victim of tedium? It's, it was really interesting. You know, there's a lot of stuff in this I was able to kind of connect and think about other literature that I've read up to this point with. Um, while, I was, while I was reading this section, I was reading Pedro Paramo. And um, like I, since I, as I mentioned, I've been reading it the whole last month as I've been doing the other books. <clears throat> so um, tedium is kind of like the worst kind of existential depression. Um, and tedium is such a strange word to describe it, so understated, and it really highlights um, uh, Fernando Pessoa's disconnect and kind of cold detachment from himself and his own feelings. And, you know, this goes the entire book. And um, at this point, um, there is kind of a spoiler, I guess it is kind of a spoiler, so... If you if, if you want to go into this without any sort of idea, I would say, I mean, you get the idea of what kind of book this is. It's it's this introspective diary. OK, it's an it's an introspective diary of um, a normal man's life in Lisbon, Portugal in the 1920s and 30s, but an incredibly imaginative, introverted man who um who basically suffers existentially and um, and and uh, loses himself in dreams. And there's all this talk about dreaming and how how dreaming is the most important thing to him. And some of the things he dreams are mentioned, but we never get true descriptions of what he dreams. He even keeps his dreams private from us for the most part, which is really fascinating. So it's almost a book about... It's like it's like thinking about thinking itself without even telling you the real thoughts that are going on. And it's it's such a strange way that a, a, a philosopher, narrator, a writer can disguise, um, you, you know, you can either disguise what you're really thinking by um, just talking about the action and the events that occur in the real world and not revealing anything the character is thinking or the narrator. Or you can disguise your thoughts by just talking about the act and philosophizing about the act of thinking itself. And I never considered that. But so much, you know, again, I spent this whole book talking to Fernando Pessoa as if he were a friend and somebody that I was spending a short vacation with and getting to know. And he was like taking me around Lisbon, I guess, like say someone I, like a, he. He was like my Airbnb for Lisbon, for Lisbon in 1920 and 1930s. Uh, I, I kind of looked at it that way. Um, but really, I became very captivated with him and his thinking. And um, at the same time, after all this time I spent with him and walking along uh, the, the coastline with him, the, the, the boardwalk and, and the streets of Lisbon and talking to him and sitting and watching the rain, I still feel I have no, I don't know him. And the closest, this is the spoiler. So if you, if this book interests you, definitely go check it out. And, um, and don't listen to this spoiler because I feel like it's more of, it's more of an emotional spoiler because there's no story here. Um, there is kind of an arc, kind of an arc to the way the chapters are organized, but it's, 
um, it's all over the place, really. Um, I hope I can find it, but there's like, there's like one chapter where Fernando Pessoa says, you know, like, um, he admits, he admits his longing for connection. And, um, it was just such a heartbreaking, um, chapter because this whole, it was, it's the only one. It's the only one. Um, there was, um, something apparently that I thought was, was one of the most important, uh, things he wrote in the book. I don't know why. Um, even though I just lost it. Good advice. Oh, here we go. To think of our greatest anxiety as an insignificant event, not only in the life of the universe, but also in the life of our own soul, is the beginning of wisdom. To think this way right in the midst of our anxiety is the height of wisdom. And um, that's just how one of them starts. He, he expands on that. Um... But yeah, anyway, there, there, there was this one chapter that um, I should have um, marked it better, but it just stunningly revealed that um, there is a sadness going on under all this. And, um, and it was right after I, I had written, like, Fernando, you reduce life and other people just too much. Sometimes he, he's just so in his head and so... Um, you know, so, and again, it, I don't know if it's Fernando or Bernardo, but, like, he's, he's just so, um, far away, and you just want to, you just want to bring him back, and, and want him to enjoy the simple, uh, things, and, and it's kind of like, is he a genius, is he a misunderstood genius, or is he, is he just, like, missing these big parts of life and what's really going on around him because he's so, I guess, feeling disconnected by it or disgusted by it. Um, and, uh, and I, I can't find it right now, but that there was that one chapter that just, um, kind of took off, took off the covers and, um, and, and made you realize that he, he has always longed, um, for, for some kind of um, connection to others when he was young, and um, and he just was not able to to obtain that, and and now the the only way that he can feel connected to others is through this kind of um, abstract dreaming that he does. Um, so, so like, there's something kind of heartbreaking about, about the book and it, and it makes me reflect too on, on just kind of life itself. And, and of course m makes you reflect on how in, in some ways we are alone, um, with ourselves, you know, a a at the end of things. And, and it's like a lot of people, we don't want it to be that way, but, but in reality, we are all kind of in our own heads, and um, this is someone who just has no self-delusion about that, that they know that they are alone, they know that um, that this is their reality. And a lot of us, um, maybe we, we think we have connections with others, but we, we, can't, we can't really be sure that they are reciprocating the same kinds of things. And I think that goes back to um, some of the themes touched on in other books, like The True Deceiver, um, which of course is one of my favorites, and the first one I talked about for a reason, because I've read it multiple times. And um, <clears throat> that book, you know, that's another another kind of deception that we have is like the, the things that we say and do to make others feel connected to us, or we try to give the impression, we reach out and we try we try to connect to others and we don't really know if it's a deception or not. It might be, it might even 
we might even be aware that it's a deception, but it's still important. Like even just that attempt at connectedness is is still worth it. And um, Fernando Pessoa's narrator here is somebody who doesn't think that kind of deception is worth is worth it. He is a Katri Kling uh, from the True Deceiver. That that's kind of where he falls in that. And um, in many ways, his kind of um, and he, th there are passages that even allude to this, but his sort of thinking, his 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 um, rejection of the world, the physical world for the dreaming, seems to be um, a prison, and and can in fact become a prison. Or as it's stated in um, another book I love by Ernesto Sabato, who I will probably talk about one of his books when I get to Argentina. Um, so that I can reread it. Uh, the, the One of his books, The Tunnel, actually the main character of The Tunnel, besides being a painter and not a writer and poet uh, or assistant bookkeeper, um, the main character, Castell, is a man who's completely inside his own head. Um, and being completely inside his own head, he follows a metaphorical tunnel where he is completely alone, not connected to others, totally aware that he is he is um, following a path that no one else can see, um, but him. That no one else can feel, but him. That he's he's running along others in in a parallel metaphorical tunnel. Um, it's a prison, you know, and or a tunnel. Uh, this this way of thinking can be, and. Um, and we must, and that's where, that's kind of the perils of dreaming, that I don't know if this main character really notices, but I certainly noticed it um, in, in the moments of depression that are discussed, and existential depression, and, and even real um, sadness, as he, as he mentions, the sadness of disconnection with others that, um, that uh, again, is this, is this another kind of deception? So, uh, a self-deception that you are alone. Um, I feel like there's arguments that somebody who says, well, in the end, we're all alone, could just as easily be deceiving themselves about the world as as someone who says we're all connected. So, um, wow, this, has, this video has just been like an off-the-rails... Uh, I don't know. I don't even know what this video is, but this is what I'm doing with this project is I read the book, I turn on my camera, and I just talk about what I felt about it. Um, the lighting seems like it's a little bit weird from what I've been seeing. That's kind of been distracting my, my gaze, how the, the lighting keeps shifting. So hopefully, hopefully on the video, um, it won't come off that bad. Um, but if so, it is what it is. Uh, think of it as something artistic to do with the book of Disquiet, like the... Uh, uh, shadow and light of uh, the imaginary world or some nonsense like that. Um, but anyway, yeah, the, I, I really just, the, the thing is, read the book, talk what I feel about it, um, and and try to connect it too to the other, to the other reading. But I think that that major theme in this book of being um, isolated and, and looking for connection and it's like, this book is like, you're supposed to push back. You're supposed to, um, I, I almost want to believe, I don't know if this is true, but I want to believe that Fernando Pessoa, in writing this book with a um, pseudonym or hieronym uh, of, um, of Bernardo Soares, um, wanted to create a character which you were supposed to struggle with. I want to feel like I did... I approach this book exactly how you should, uh, writing, writing back, writing back inside the book um, to the, this, this narrator. Because if I hadn't, if I hadn't written back, I would have just been so consumed with this sense of isolation and depression. And yes, there are moments of beauty, but wow, I, I just could not, I could not let myself be fully pulled into that world because I don't want to. And, and that fight, 
that that struggle that I had writing in the book, like responding and calling out the narrator on things that I thought were wrong. I feel like that is part of the whole process. I want to believe that Fernando Pessoa wrote intentionally into this book um, and made it seem so real. Like you cannot distinguish what is Fernando Pessoa from his character. It, and, and that is unique in this novel. Um, there are novels where it's like, I guess, I guess you can say that about other novels where you can't, when it's told in first person, you can't really distinguish the character from the narrator. Some, some books, it's much easier to do that than others. But in this one, what's so different about it is that it seems like a diary entry. It seems like an autobiography it's, or a factless autobiography, as it's called. And so um, this struggle, this struggle with the book is what made it worthwhile. And it's definitely one I'm going to go back to. It's definitely one I'm going to go back to. Um, Bernard, Bernardo um, Soares or Fernando Pessoa, I don't know which one to say, have become um, kind of friends that now live in my mind that I can't fully get away from because as much as I I disagree with some things there were there were some really worthwhile things to think about and sometimes by encountering something that we disagree with or that that um, sometimes disgusts us at the same time it it mystifies and um, impresses us which is how I would describe this book is um, it's a it's a true learning experience to wrestle with that kind of book and that's why I've kind of been drawing this video out so long because um, I've been trying to, to 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 find that conclusion I really don't even know what I feel about these books completely until I sit here and and talk to you guys about it so really what these videos are are you uh, experiencing me uh, figuring out what I feel or think about these books. And sometimes I have ideas um, going into these videos of what I'm going to say, but it's, it's definitely, um, it's not, it's not planned. And there's always things that I say that I'm surprised that I say after the video. And when I, when I um, go back to watch it uh, later, I, I'm like, wow, really? I, <laughs> I never, I didn't realize that that's, that's what I thought about the book. Or that that had um, been such a major theme to me or, or that important to me. So, um, yeah, thank you for watching um, if you've made it this far and, and following this journey. Um, I certainly don't expect everybody to watch every video. That would be that would be a lot. But um, uh, or even even get to the end of a video. So if you have like awesome, I'm glad uh, I'd love to hear what you think about the book. Um, or any other books that I've written. And um, the next the next video, I think, is going to be interesting. I might be doing kind of a pause in advancing through the countries, but I'm thinking about doing a bonus episode, and that through this project, I'm going to do a few bonus episodes where I give myself the satisfaction to dive deeper into one of the authors that I've already read, or one of the countries that I've already read that I'm really curious to read a second book by. So by allowing myself that kind of breather, I think every 20 books might be a great time to do that. And um, this is also the point when I said I was um, going to reflect on, on how the project was going and where it was going. I don't have too many qualms about that. I, I think um, that's this is the main thing, is that I'm, I, I want to give myself every 20 books or so a chance to uh, to explore one country a little bit more or an author, uh, or, or find a book that I feel is really important. So that's going to be a surprise. Um, but yeah, once again, thank you for joining me on this journey. Uh, and we'll see you next time.